Well, good morning and welcome to this service of the word given to you from St Andrew's, Oxford. My name's Dan, I'm the vicar at the church and it's great to be able to welcome family and friends uh, from St Andrew's and those tuning in from further afield uh, here this morning. This is the end of our World Mission Week. We've been focusing in our prayer times through the week uh, on our mission partners. Uh, we looked at it, we heard from a few of them last weekend and we're going to hear some more from uh, some of them this weekend as well as we continue to pray for their work and for our partnership in the gospel. Uh, we'll also have the opportunity later on to uh, contribute and to support them financially too. It's all part of our service and worship of God together and the fact that we know that we are one big family in him. This is also the Easter season, so let me start this service uh, by declaring those great words which you can find on your service sheet, which you'll also find on the live stream page of the website. Please do take that now if you haven't got it in front of you. And let me say those words of acclamation in this Easter season. Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Alleluia! So let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thought of, thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. O oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let not the flood overwhelm me, nor the depth swallow me up. Let not the pit shut its mouth upon me. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Hear me, O Lord, as your loving kindness is good. Turn to me as your compassion is great. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Well, may God, who loved the world so much that he gave his Son to be our Saviour, to die for our sins upon the cross, to rise again to glory, to forgive us our sins and to make us holy, to serve him in the world. Amen. As a forgiven people, we now come to praise God and we do it um, in the words of a lovely hymn. Thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight, hear us we humbly pray. And where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. It's a prayer for God's light, the light of his word, to go across the world. And how is going to lead us now as we sing.
up with Ellis Sama who's one of our mission partners in South Sudan uh, and we're going to watch a short clip of uh, Ellis Sama and Tom now as uh, they spoke together and Ellis Sama explained some of the challenges that he is facing and his country is facing right now and then after that interview um, Dot is going to read um, from uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians for us before Rachel and Jason uh, Jason, again, is one of our mission partners who are going to bring us um, God's Word this morning. And I'm Elisama uh, Daniel in South Sudan. Uh, I want to thank San Andrews for praying along and supporting and uh, encouraging me and uh, us. Uh, your support is not just to me, but it's to the people of South Sudan. I'm so delighted for that. And across is very grateful. I have been in Across over the last five years, and uh, Across vision is to uh, seek a cross-centered transformation of South Sudan communities and beyond. And that means we work with the most vulnerable people and communities in the country, and we actually go to, we are in the most difficult places to reach. And if I tell you South Sudan has no infrastructure, you will not believe it, but zero infrastructure. There are only very, very few roads and we reach to those communities. We come to them with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. We will seek to meet their physical, spiritual, and emotional and psychological needs. So that is the work of our cross here in South Sudan. But we also have presence in uh, the refugee camps in Uganda, also reaching out to the South Sudanese people. So our calling is to to help work alongside the church to reach communities with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole person. You are a part-time PhD student through OCMS here in Oxford. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it is you are studying and how that relates to the work of the church mm -hmm. in South Sudan? Mm -hmm. Yes, I started coming to OCMS and Oxford over seven years ago and uh, when I first came uh, the first church I went to was St. Andrews and I didn't know I would be connected in this special way so each time I'm in Oxford uh, at OCMS I come to St. Andrews. My journey started when I was a student I, uh, before I finished from university I got involved with the students work and I became actually the first uh, staff worker of the students movement, which is IFES uh, in Sudan, when Sudan was one country, I became the first general secretary. And when we were, in, we were working among students in colleges and universities, our desire was to see godly leaders for both the church and the nation. But then I worked with open doors, working among uh, unreached people, as particularly Muslims. That was where I worked with after after uh, IFES. And then I got to work with government when peace came to South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan had been at war for a very, very long time. 
the South against the North, and the North is Islamic, and South is mainly Christian and animist. So when I, peace came, the new nation of South Sudan was still beginning and starting. So I got involved with government. I worked with the Anti-Corruption Commission. And uh, with my work with the government, I realized that the vision of the students' work, we call it focus here, the vision of focus to see godly leadership for the church and nation was a reality. The country was starting at the wrong footing. There was a lot of corruption and the fear of God was not there among the leaders. It has even continued up to today. So I said I needed to research and study uh, corruption, but looking at how the church can contribute in uh, nation building, but focusing on the issue of corruption that is devastating South Sudan and even many other countries. So many new satellites in Juba, and Corona is just one of them. So the issue of displacement and refugees is there. Uh, because of the war, uh, food insecurity is, is a serious matter. So with COVID-19, you know, we are now in a semi-partial lockdown. Uh, we now have 35 confirmed cases, and it's not as serious as elsewhere. But because of the fear of it spreading, and if it spreads, if there's a serious outbreak here, the health system is terrible. It's nothing. There's actually nothing. We have, we are told we have 24 uh, beds to, for isolation. And these beds are in a tent. It's not a building, it's a tent. So that's the preparedness. Uh, that's the level of preparedness we have. So uh, in addition to the 5 million uh, food insecure population, the number has even increased for those who are who are not food insecure, who are dependent in the markets, uh, and economically, it's causing a lot of uh, hardship for many, many families. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's more complex. In fact, people fear more of not the COVID itself, but the impact of COVID on the livelihoods of people who go for work. So. I really appreciate your continuous prayers and support. I really appreciate it. I'm so, so grateful for St. Andrew's continuous prayer and support for, for me. I, I, I have no words to express that. So grateful. And may God bless you all. The reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For you yourselves know, my dear family, that our visit to you didn't turn out to be empty. On the contrary, we had already undergone awful things and been shamefully treated in Philippi, as you know. But we were open and exuberant in our God in declaring to you the gospel of God, despite a good deal of opposition. When we made our appeal, you see, we are not deceiving people. We don't have any impure motives. We aren't playing some kind of trick. Rather, we speak as people whom God has validated to be entrusted with the gospel. Not with a view to pleasing people, but in order to please God who validates our hearts. For we never used flattering words, as you know, nor were we saying things insincerely as a cover-up for greed, as God is our witness. We weren't looking for recognition from anybody, either you or anyone else, though we could have imposed on you as the Messiah's emissaries. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse taking care of her own children. We were so devoted to you that we gladly intended to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives, because you became so dear to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Good morning. Good morning. The best part of my job is undoubtedly the people that I get to meet. Uh, and I'd like to tell you about one of those this morning. His name's Pastor B. He's from a country in Central Asia, uh, close to the border with China. And I met him at the end of last year. I was taken to his home in the middle of the night along a very long, bumpy road uh, and whisked into his house uh, where I was greeted with a very large table of food and invited to sit down and eat. Um, we began to talk. He told me about his situation. He and his wife and his children had moved to a very poor neighbourhood with a dream of seeing a community of Jesus followers established amongst the poorest of the poor. Uh, he dealt regularly with false accusations from, from neighbours. Uh, they would regularly call the police and report on his activity. Sometimes the police would come and fine him, sometimes worse. And yet he has persevered in this place uh, with the aim of seeing this community, this church, planted. As we talked, I asked him more about the people that he served. And he said with a wry smile, oh, you should ask my wife. So I did. This is what she told me. She described uh, a particular group called the Invisibles. These are the most vulnerable in this society. Uh, and they're most vulnerable because they don't have any documentation, usually because of theft or fraud or trafficking. And because they don't have any documentation, in the eyes of the state, they do not exist. They are invisible. And because of their invisibility, they suffer greatly with no support whatsoever. And it's this group of people that this couple were seeking to reach. One of the problems that they noticed early on was that these people suffered with very severe skin problems because they couldn't keep clean. So Pastor B decided that he was going to do something about this. He decided he was going to create a bathhouse. So the plan was, very simply, that these people would be able to come along, um, have their dirty clothes cleaned, be given a bath, and then be given clean clothes to go away with. Uh, and this is what happened. Uh, Pastor B set this up, but he didn't tell his wife. So she described coming home one day, finding a queue of people out of her front door and down the street, and entering the house and finding one of these people in her own bath. We were so devoted to you that we gladly intended to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives, because you became so dear to us. I don't know about you, but I would seriously struggle if I came home to find a queue of people outside our house needing to use the bathroom and perhaps even somebody in the shower. We just don't do that around here. It's countercultural. It's different to the cultural norms. Uh, but I love that story of Pastor B because it tells me something about his commitment to do out of the ordinary things for people he loved and because he wanted them to see the difference Jesus made in his life. And this passage in Thessalonians tells that if we want to see people transformed by Jesus, they need to see the difference Jesus has made in our lives. Thessalonica was a regional capital city. It was cosmopolitan and it had a large Jewish population. Uh, and it was into this city that three men, Paul, Silas and Timothy, arrived emotionally and physically bruised after a brutal time in Philippi. They had been stripped naked and beaten publicly. They had been imprisoned in stocks and threatened. And after their release, they moved to Thessalonica, where despite their previous experience, they committed again to sharing the good news of King Jesus. They joined the Jewish community, they went to the synagogue, and as they announced the good news of Jesus, many people were convinced from the Jewish and Gentile community and became followers of Jesus. Of course, that created a great commotion and they had to leave, leaving behind a flourishing, committed and loving, but very young community of Jesus followers. How were they doing? A few months on, Paul wanted to know. They'd got into his heart. So he sent Timothy to find out, and the news was good. They were still enthusiastic. They were still committed to Jesus, despite suspicion and certain persecution. So Paul wrote to them 
to stay strong. Stay strong in love, in holiness and in hope. That's the message of Thessalonians. And in this bit here, he reminds them of why they can trust the gospel. Despite everything they're going to go through, they can trust the message of Jesus. It's because the message of Jesus wasn't just something Paul, Silas and Timothy talked about. They modeled it in their lives. There were open books letting people come in to see what it was like to live with Jesus day by day. And people did see the difference. And in this passage, we can see what differences he's talking about. After their shameful treatment in Philippi, the men could have gone into self-protection mode. They could have nursed their bruises, hunkered down and looked after themselves. Self-care, if you like. But instead of self-protection, they modelled openness, exuberance. They were gentle and devoted with other people. They talked about Jesus and they modelled the change he had made in their lives on an everyday basis. They allowed people in without self-pity. And this added weight to the message they were talking about. They were willing to go through bad treatment again if it meant Jesus was announced. They were willing to nurture people, invest their emotional energy in them, love them and care for them because they were so devoted to teaching and leading them. They could also have gone into self-promotion mode. In fact, this would have been expected from passing through teachers in Thessalonica. There were loads of them. Religious teachers were too a penny at the time and they would have been expected to look for payment of some kind. Money, of course, but sexual prey and favours and public prestige. Everyone wanted a good reputation and to be known. But instead, they were different. Well, they could have leaned heavily on their reputations as apostles, as messiahs, emissaries. They could have leaned on their accreditations and entitlements. They could have demanded recognition. They could have tooted their own horn. But instead of self-promotion, God's validation was all they needed. They were grafters. They worked hard for their own livelihoods, working hard by day, speaking in the evenings and the, at night to the, to the followers and in the synagogues. The people who became followers of Jesus would have expected to have to look after these men financially. It was what people did back then. New religious teachers were taken care of. But instead of demanding generosity, Paul and his friends gave generously to the people around them. They modelled it. Instead of demanding respect and, and honour, they modelled integrity. They didn't need flattery and to butter people up to make Jesus' message more palatable. So instead of self-promotion and instead of self-protection, they opened up their lives generously and humbly, imperfect as they were. It was genuine love to this newly formed community that marked their lives there. Let me tell you about Marat. He also leads a group of churches, small house churches, because in his country it isn't safe to gather in the way that we normally would here. Uh, he moved into a new neighbourhood to plant another new church. Uh, but to make that possible, he also had to work. He had to earn money to feed his family. So at night, he was a security guard. By day, a pastor. By night, a security guard. Uh, he told me how he had his mobile phone stolen while he was at work. Uh, the mobile phone is his lifeline. Uh, uh, a key item for his own safety in his context and it was stolen and he knew uh, who had stolen it but he decided not to report the stealing of his mobile phone because he knew the man who had stolen it had a family to feed and he didn't want him to lose his job. On another occasion his bike was stolen this is his means of of getting around other communities doing his work as a pastor he decided not to report the stealing of his bike because he didn't want to cause problems for his neighbours. He knew that if he reported 
his bike being stolen, the police would come and would work their way through the neighbourhood interviewing everybody. He decided that that would be too much trouble for his neighbours so he didn't report the stealing of his bike. He and his family have to grow food in their own field to feed themselves. They also share what they grow generously with those around them and they've been living like this for years and he described how years of anim animosity and suspicion slowly shifted and then one by one how his neighbours have come to him quietly usually in the evening and asked him this question what is it about you that is different why is it that you live so generously when you have been treated so poorly including by us what is it that makes you different and you probably won't be surprised to know Paul certainly wouldn't have been surprised to know that in that context with that kind of lifestyle despite all the challenges the church in that place is growing their whole of life sharing was attractive to the Thessalonians and so different to what they expected and it's the same here in Oxford. We're a cosmopolitan, a cosmopolitan place, lots of people come and go, well maybe not so much at the moment, but generally we're a place that people visit and pass through. Uh, lots of important people come here as well, status really matters. And our neighbours and our friends are suspicious or cynical or critical of anything to do with Jesus. John Ortberg says, It's only as we seek to do what Jesus says, to be generous and forgiving and radically truthful, that we discover the kingdom he talks about is real and can be trusted. The wonderful thing is that when we discover Jesus is real, when we live his way. Others, others will see that as well. So think of your colleagues and your neighbours and your friends. In our culture of self-promotion, selfies, I did this, I said this, I wrote this. Who looks at your life and is astounded at how other-centred you are? Who watches you serve others, practically with food perhaps, or by listening to them, uh, who, looks at the, who looks at you doing that and marvels at your willingness to give of yourself to others, especially at a time like this? Who leaves a conversation with you feeling richer and more loved and asks themselves, what makes them be like this? Many people will be struggling during this COVID-19 pandemic we have heartbreaking loss around us, financial insecurity, loneliness and fear. And we get tired, believe me, I get tired. And it's so easy to slip into self-promotion mode, isn't it? Who do we reach out to in love and let them experience peace and hope in conversation with us? How have you connected with your neighbours Maybe over Zoom, maybe over the fence during the Thursday evening clap for the carers. How do you take those conversations further than just regular, well, how are you and what are you doing? What do you need? Can I get it for you? Would you like to have a coffee or a beer and a Zoom or a virtual get together, a socially distanced chat? If we want to see people transformed by Jesus, they have to hear about and see the transformation in us. Like, like many of you, we're um, trying to serve our neighbours. We're, we're part of a, uh, a street WhatsApp group that's been brilliant as, as people have um, practically supported one another in all kinds of ways. Um, one of the things that we've also been part of on, on our street is a, is a prayer initiative um, initiated by uh, one of the other Christians uh, in our road who um, asked if we'd like to be part of sending a note around every door um, simply saying we're Christians uh, we'd love to pray for you how can we pray for you 
and, and everyone was given a candle and they were invited to uh, put the candle in their window, lighting it safely at a certain time um, every week. And, and a number of our neighbours have done that. Um, one of our elderly neighbours, having received this, um, sent a WhatsApp message to Rachel. Uh, the WhatsApp message said this, Thank you for the candle. I'm not religious and I don't pray, but I will light it anyway. Uh, Rachel replied, I'd love to talk to you more about this. Let's have another FaceTime tea sometime in the next few days. Um, this neighbour has been in and out of our house regularly. Um, she comes into um, our very um, cold um, air conditioning in the heat of summer. Uh, so we know her quite well. Uh, and they, Rachel and her had another chat. And, and during the course of a, what was a quite a long conversation, um, Rachel asked her, tell me more about what you said on WhatsApp. Why are you not religious? And, and our neighbour described how she actually grew up um, going to church, connected to a local church, but how at a couple of critical moments in the life of her family, they felt left, let down um, by the church. And then she said this to Rachel, um, you see, you're what I think a Christian really is. You look after others. You're not worried about what it costs you. You just get on and do it to help others. Rachel responded, I'm glad you experienced that, but it's not what makes me a Christian. That conversation is to be continued. If we want to see change in others by Jesus, we have to let them see the difference that Jesus has made in us. Having heard that challenge from Jason and Rachel, we now come to affirm our faith together in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well, we now come to a time of prayer. And before David leads us in our intercessions, in our prayers this morning, we are going to hear uh, an invitation to pray from the choir of St Andrews as they sing for us and over us, Lead Me Lord.
Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay. Um, I am based in the north of Spain in a city called Gijón, which is very hard to pronounce for most people. Um, it's in the region of Asturias and um, yeah, we're fortunate enough to be one of the least affected areas in Spain with the coronavirus. Um, although we have been under strict confinement measures uh, as with the rest of Spain. Um, normally my job involves um, English teaching. Um, my team leaders have a business admission approach with an English academy. Um, and we're also involved with a youth project. We have a youth center where we run um, weekly activities on a Friday. for It's for non-churched youth, so non-Christians are coming along to that. Um, and then we also have a faith group that we're involved with um, that we've set up for adults who are interested in reading the Bible and exploring faith with us. So, yeah, they're the key things that I'm involved with. Some moments you can look back to in the last few months where you've seen God at work. Uh, who was learning to be a Jesuit priest um, has, been, has started becoming involved in the faith group. He's a, philo a local philosophy teacher. Um, he's Spanish, his wife's American. And she has a Protestant background. But um, it's been fantastic to have them on board. He obviously has a lot of knowledge of the Bible. Um, and it gives a real authentic Spanish voice to the group. So that has been an amazing addition to the faith group. And he, being a philosophy teacher, we've got him involved. He's come along one night to the, to the youth centre to share, um, to lead a debate on... We did it on Valentine's night and he did it on love and truth. Um, and there was a great debate among the older age group uh, along those lines. And so, yeah, we just see him as a really key contact that God's given us. And we're praying for him. And um, yeah, who knows where that's going to lead in the future. But it's an exciting thing that's happened uh, yeah, fairly recently. Certainly our hope would be, and um, that's what we're praying, is that um, during this time of confinement that God's at work bringing questions, directing people's hearts and minds to think about the deeper meaning of life. And we'd love to be able to have some of those conversations and perhaps um, more structured chats or debates with the, with the older group face-to-face. -face. I think in the meantime, it's hard to have that over a screen uh, in a virtual way. Um, but potentially it could come up. And so where we're at, we're just open and praying for opportunities and that we'll take them when they come. Um, my sense is that that will be when we're more face-to-face -face and less uh, restricted environments. Um, but yeah, so for the time being, we're praying and, and seeking to see where God uh, opens up the doors. Broadly, what, what's your prayers over the next coming weeks and months? Um, I think, yeah, we pray for creativity and wisdom to know how to interact in a virtual way and uh, that's in a way that's meaningful and intentional as well. Um, and then and then again, the same thing for when there is less restrictions and we're face to face uh, and we're able to perhaps prompt those conversations as well for creative ways to do that. Um you know, Spain's a very hard context for the, for the gospel and you have to be, it's very relational uh, in terms of uh, how you can talk about things and um, approach even the topics, I suppose. So, yeah, I think that they're two key things, creativity and, and wisdom to know what to say, when and how to say it. And, um, yeah, in a way that really hooks people in and answers their questions. Hello, my name's David Coates and I'm a member of the St Andrew's World Mission Group. Shall we pray? Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the Gospel of God, but our lives as well. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you loved us so much that you gave your one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. May this message of salvation and hope ring out across the world at this time of crisis and uncertainty. We pray that through life's difficult circumstances, your purpose will prevail and your name be glorified, and that through the faithful testimony of your people, many more will come to recognise and accept you as their Saviour and King. 
Give wisdom and courage, we pray, to those who lead the nations of the world, and in particular this country. Guide them in the decisions they take and surround them with wise counsellors. We pray for lives to be saved from COVID-19 and its knock-on impact. For those mourning loved ones to be comforted. For all those struggling at home, struggling financially or with any kind of illness, to be able to look beyond their present difficulties to you, the giver and sustainer of life. In this World Mission Week, we pray for our mission partners, today recalling what Elisama and Lindsay have shared with us. Please strengthen and protect the work of a cross in South Sudan as it seeks to meet the needs of a desperate people for the provision of food for the hungry and health care and protection in such a fragile context. We pray that the people of that land will know the perfect love that casts out fear. Bless and protect Elisama, his faith, his family, his leadership, his studies. Thank you for Lindsay in Gijon and for what you are doing through her and all those engaged in reaching young people with the gospel. In this time of confinement, we pray for creativity and wisdom in knowing how to connect with people in ways that point to you that your words will be given to Lindsay and her team and they will know the right place and time to share them. As a result of your work in Spain and South Sudan and in each country and context where St Andrew's Mission Partners are working today, may many more men and women, girls and boys, come to faith in you and experience the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. Lastly, we pray for our church family, for wisdom and encouragement for those who lead us, for the fruit of your spirit to be growing daily in our lives and for the protection of friends and family. We remember your words spoken through the psalmist. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honour them. With long life will I satisfy them and show them my salvation. Please now join me as we close using the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. We've heard this morning about how we can share not only the good news of Jesus in the gospel, but our very lives as well. If you want to know more about the work of our mission partners, you can find that in the World Mission Booklet, which is available on our website on the live stream page just under the click access to this service. You'll also find there a button which uh, will take you to a giving page. This is really for those who uh, would consider themselves as part of the St Andrews family. It feels really weird doing this uh, online. Um, but for those that are part of the St Andrews family, you'll know that this is something we do regularly. That part of the way that we worship God together is by contributing our finances as well, by giving of all that God has given us to his work. And at this time of year, we contribute in particular, we give to our mission partners. You've heard about their work over the last week or so. We've been praying for them. Can I ask you, would you also give to their work, to encourage them, to help them co to continue in the difficult circumstances in which they find themselves. Thank you so much for responding. You'll find the link uh, on the live stream webpage and also in my weekly letter. Well now we're going to sing a final song. Uh, Matthew is going to lead us in this song uh, which 
is all about proclaiming Jesus. Tell all the world of Jesus. Tell all the world of Jesus, our Saviour, Lord and King. And let the whole creation of his salvation sing. Proclaim his glorious greatness in nature and in grace. Creator and Redeemer, the Lord of time and space. Tell all the world of Jesus that everyone may find the joy of his forgiveness, true peace of heart and mind. Proclaim his perfect goodness, his deep unfailing care, his love so rich in mercy, a love beyond compare. Tell all the world of Jesus that everyone may know of his almighty triumph, defeating every foe. Proclaim his coming glory when sin is overthrown. And he shall reign in splendor, the King upon his throne. As we come to the end of our time together this morning, Let's pray. Risen Christ, by the lakeside you renewed your call to your disciples. Help your church to obey your command and draw the nations to the fire of your love, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you, be with those whom you love and those for whom you pray, this day and always. Amen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness and has made us light to the world. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! <laughs>